Good morning. Today's first scripture lesson is from the first and second chapters of the book of Hebrews. Listen for the word of God. Going through a long line of prophets, God has been addressing our ancestors in different ways for centuries. Recently, he spoke to us directly through his son. By his son, God created the world in the beginning, and it will all belong to the son at the end. The son perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with God's nature. He holds everything together by what he says, powerful words. After he finished the sacrifice for sins, the son took his honored place high in the heavens right alongside God, far higher than any angel in rank and rule. Did God ever say to an angel, you are my son, today I celebrate you, or I'm his father, he is my son. When he presents his honored son to the world, he says all angels must worship him. God didn't put angels in charge of this business of salvation that we are dealing with here. It says in scripture, what is man and woman that you bother with them? Why take a second look their way? You made them not quite as high as angels, bright with Eden's dawn light. Then you put them in charge of your entire handcrafted world. When God put them in charge of everything, nothing was excluded, but we don't see it yet. Don't see everything under human jurisdiction. What we do see is Jesus, made not quite as high as angels, and then through the experience of death, crowned so much higher than any angel, with a glory bright with Eden's dawn light. In that death, by God's grace, he fully experienced death in every person's place. It makes good sense that the God who got everything started and keeps everything going now completes the work by making the salvation pioneer perfect through suffering as he leads all these people to glory. Since the one who saves and those who are saved have a common origin, Jesus doesn't hesitate to treat them as family, saying, I tell you, my good friends, my brothers and sisters, all I, 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 all I know about you, I'll join them in worship and praise to you. Today's section, second, second scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. The people brought the children to Jesus, hoping he might touch them. The disciples shooed them off, but Jesus was irate and let them know it. Don't push these children away. Don't ever get between them and me. These children are at the very center of life in the kingdom. Mark this, unless you accept God's kingdom in the simplicity of a child, you'll never get in. Then gathering the children up in his arms, he laid his hands of blessing on them. The words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Wasn't it great to see the kids coming forward for the children's message? I mean, wasn't, wasn't that powerful? I love to see children's bright, smiling faces and uh, their eagerness in learning about the gospel. I love being here on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings when parents are dropping their kids off for our Moms Morning Out children's education program. Do you know that we have over 90 kids registered coming every Tuesday and Thursday here to the church? We've had to add teachers this year to handle the influx of children. And it's not a daycare, it's Christian education. And we're so happy to see those kids. On Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights, kids and adults are also getting Christian education and learning more about our Savior and the gospel message. And I think it's important for us to be reminded of the importance of children in the Christian faith. We're all God's children but the importance of young people in our church and in the eyes of God. Here at first, we put great store in the safety and lives of our children. And that's what I want to think about a little bit today as we reflect on the important story from our gospel message in the Gospel of Mark this morning. In this passage, we're joining Jesus and the disciples at a real crunch point in the gospel narrative. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He knows he's going to be crucified. But the importance of receiving children is such that even in this period of emotional agony, he finds time for them. The story is a well-known one, and it's a lovely image of Jesus, isn't it? We've all seen Sunday school images and paintings of Jesus with a smile on his face, with a 
little children around him. The picture that you see in front of you today is one that I happened to pick up at the CAP office when I was driving someone over there for some support services. The CAP office has a little thrift shop. It's not much. But this picture was sitting there for a dollar. And it just reached out and touched me. And I'm going to find a frame for it. And we're going to put it in the children's wing upstairs because I think it speaks to us about Jesus' love for children. And I hope you'll take the time to take a look when you come up for communion today at that picture. I think it reflects our gospel story today perfectly. And it's one of those biblical stories, it's right up there with the nativity as an example of a nice story that rarely gets beneath our skin and we really understand what's happening here. So let's look at it in a little more detail to see what we can learn about God through this story. First we read in verse 13 that people were bringing children to him. Perhaps the image you have in your mind is a group of mothers taking their children to, you know, a mom's morning out or some other daycare. Um, and, or they're taking a day out back in the first century to see this famous man called Jesus. An exciting activity, something like that. But the truth is, the way the passage is written in Greek, the truth is very different. The way the sentence is phrased is that it was actually the fathers bringing the children to see Jesus, not the mothers. And why is that important? Because in the culture of that day, fathers had the responsibility of taking their children to a rabbi to be blessed and dedicated to God. And that's what was happening here. The word bringing is not the usual one used, but it's the word that talks about making a sacrifice to God as a way of dedicating oneself as a sacrifice to God. So this was actually an intensely spiritual activity that was going on here. It wasn't just parents taking their kids for a day out to have fun with this famous man, but it was parents bringing their children to Jesus so that they could be blessed and dedicated to a life of discipleship. And that's at the heart of what we want for our children here at Rapid City First, isn't it? We want them to enjoy coming and have fun and make friends, but ultimately we're wanting our children to be blessed by God and we dedicate them to Him so that they grow up to be strong disciples. And that's the command that God gave us in Deuteronomy chapter 6 when, which says, You shall teach my laws diligently to your children and shall talk of my laws when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. It's our spiritual responsibility to nurture our children in the Christian faith at home with them by bringing them to church regularly and for those who don't have children, everyone still has a responsibility within our family here at Rapid City First to do what we can to encourage the nurturing of children in the faith. As we return to our gospel reading, we see that not everyone was happy with the children coming to see Jesus. And amazingly, the people who resented it most were the disciples. You know, those who had spent the longest time with Him and who, quite frankly, should have known better. But here were these longtime followers of Jesus openly rebuking the parents in a way that would have been both public and embarrassing. And why did they do this? Well, who knows? Maybe they were trying to protect Jesus' time and His space. Perhaps they didn't like the chaos of having so many children around. Perhaps they resented having to share their time and space with children and wanted to keep Jesus all to themselves in a nice, tidy, quiet way. Whatever their motivation, these longtime followers of Jesus should have known better. They had already forgotten something Jesus said just a few days previously in chapter 9 of Mark. Jesus had taken a child into his arms and said, Whoever receives a child in my name receives me. And yet here they are a few days later rebuking the parents and trying to get rid of the children. That did not reflect the heart of Jesus. 
In verse 13, we read, in 14, we read of Jesus' response. When Jesus saw this, he was angry. That's a pretty strong word to use, isn't it? Angry. Some translations have indignant. But Jesus was really angry with his disciples here because their actions didn't represent his value system. Remember our discussion a couple of weeks ago in the book of James? We weren't told not to get angry. We were told to be slow to anger, not to fly off the handle or react without thinking. Jesus knew here what he was doing, and he applied the emotion in a thoughtful manner. We must absolutely recognize that when we fail to encourage children in the faith, when we spurn them, Jesus will be angry with us too because our actions as a church would not represent his value system. It's not saying that children should be allowed to run riot anywhere or uh, everything that we do should be organized around children. Children and parents need to respect each other in the same way they seek respect for themselves and children. But what Jesus is saying here is that the discipleship of children and young people is at the very heartbeat of his ministry and therefore at the very heartbeat of the mission of the church and of this church. And to express the importance of discipling children and young people, Jesus gives two quick commands in verse 14. Let the children come to me. Do not stop them. If we want to reflect the heart of Jesus in our church, we have to be continually striving to find new and creative ways to encourage the children to come to him and to be continuously striving to dismantle the barriers that prevent them from finding Jesus for themselves. There's an African proverb that you probably know well. It takes a village to raise a child. In the same way, each member of our church family shares the responsibility of nurturing our children through prayer, through example, and through the building of relationships. But there's a flip side to this coin too. Jesus is teaching us here not just what we can give to our children, but also what we can receive from them. Children and adults don't have a one-way relationship. It's not just that adults are the teachers and children are the learners. But in the kingdom of God, children are also the teachers and adults are also the learners. This is a profound spiritual truth that demands a lot of humility on the part of adults. In the kingdom of God, we have to be willing to learn from our children just as we are willing to teach them. We adults must be willing to be nurtured in our faith by children just as we are willing to nurture them in our faith. And that's not some patronizing, shallow way. It absolutely means opening ourselves up to children and young people and listening to them and deeply caring about them. And they're letting them tell us about their experience with God and faith and giving them the space to teach us truths that we would otherwise fail to grasp. And Jesus is absolutely clear on this in verse 15 when he says, truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. I must be as a little child in my faith to enter the kingdom of God. So how can I know what that will look like in my own life if I don't take the time to listen to children and learn from them about matters of faith and about God? Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that our faith should be childish in the sense of immaturity, but that we are to be childlike in our faith. What does that look like? Before answering that question, let me say two things I don't believe are necessarily childlike qualities of faith, although some people have said that they are. The first is humility. Some people say humility is a childlike attribute of faith, but I'm sure you've met many children who are far from humble, in fact, I would argue that they can be very demanding. They can think the world revolves around them. They can interrupt conversations. They want our attention a lot of the time. That's to be expected because they're children and they're still learning our social rules. But it doesn't always lend itself to humility. 
Secondly, some people say that simple faith is a childlike quality, but I'm not sure about that either. I think in their innocence, children can be naturally gullible. That's not the same as having simple faith, and it's not really a good model for following Jesus. Beware false prophets and teachers, we are told time and time again. I think Jesus has two other things in mind here when he's talking about the childlike qualities of faith. The first is helplessness. At the heart of our Christian faith is the realization that we are utterly helpless before God. We don't have the strength of character to always do what is right. We don't have the spiritual strength to live disciplined and holy lives. We don't have the emotional maturity to always respond in love and with compassion. We're utterly helpless when it comes to living out the Christian life. We simply can't do it in our own strength. Just as a baby is utterly helpless without a caring adult to provide for its needs, so we are helpless before God. And true faith begins when we recognize our helplessness and are content to rest in that and stop struggling in our own strength. The second childlike quality is dependence. If we are helpless, then we have to be dependent on God. The Lord is our provider, and we are dependent on Him in this life and the next. No one can enter the kingdom of God in their own strength. No one can enter the kingdom of God through an attitude of independence. To enter the kingdom of God, we have to be childlike in acknowledging our helplessness and our dependence. And as we do that, we become inheritors of the kingdom of God and know what it's like to have life in its fullness. Having that mindset is a beautiful place to be, a beautiful way to live because we're finally released from the social pressures to succeed and we have nothing to prove to anyone anymore. Total freedom. With that mindset, we know who we are because our identity is wrapped up in Christ. And our whole sense of well-being is founded on that relationship. Paul, who wrote so much of the New Testament, is a perfect example of this as he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I am content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, all for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then I am strong. It's a beautiful state of mind to aim for, isn't it? And once we move into that state of being, the action of Jesus towards the children becomes our own experience. And Jesus took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. What a beautiful promise for us. The blessing of Jesus on our lives when we rest in our helplessness and our utter dependence on Him. So in conclusion, children are a deep and profound blessing in our lives and in the family of our church here at Rapid City First. We have a deep responsibility to nurture them in the faith. We are the village chosen by God to raise these children. And by our prayers and our example, by forming relationships with our young people, we can fulfill that responsibility. But we also have to have the humility to be taught by our children, taught what it means to be totally helpless, taught what it means to be truly dependent. And as we rest in that childlike quality of faith, the riches of the kingdom of God will be ours. Let us pray. Dear Lord, bring us a childlike faith. Let us become more helpless, more dependent on God, and See what blessings Jesus will pour out on us as a church family. Thanks be to God. Amen.